Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Brothers and sisters, welcome to episode 180 of Freshly Grounded This episode is with Musa Salam Oh, you guys can see my uh, um, broken cupboard behind me I just saw that, but that's like right in view uh, This episode is with Musa Salam And uh, a very, very powerful episode um, uh, This episode's out earlier than, 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 than other episodes uh, We normally put our episodes out on Friday But felt that it was needed to put out as, as soon as possible Um and um, essentially, I'm going to let you guys get into it. It's, it, it's with Musa, and we speak about the current uh, kind of climate, what's happening uh, with Black Lives Matter. But we 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 go a bit deeper in speaking about kind of um, systematic racism, um, uh, and 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 loads of different topics we touch there: racism within uh, Muslims, um, uh, assist, both systematic but also individual uh, experiences. Um, and so this is a very, very interesting one, guys. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave some links in the bio um, for you guys to be able to kind of get some resources or some links uh, to share, to donate um, or to or to sign petitions of. Uh, so you can grab them uh, from the bio, inshallah. And uh, without any further ado, enjoy. This is episode 180 of Freshly Grounded with Musa Salam. And welcome to Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast by best friends Faisal and Sam. Huh? I welcome. I said welcome to Freshly Grounded. No, after that bit, the brand new podcast. And after that bit, my best friends, face with Sam. Really? We should be live. Um, we're not live, live. I'm. I am live uh, recording this, but um, it's gonna go up um, after I've done the intro and stuff. But uh, Salamu alaikum, Musa. How you doing? Salam, salam. Good. What's happening? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. I had a bit of a mishap in that I uh, I threw this T-shirt on and uh, I, we had a steamer at the office, uh, which I've never really used properly. And so I thought, oh, when I get to the office, I'll steam it and I haven't been able to figure it out. So I'm trying like now having to cross my arms to make sure we don't uh, embarrass ourselves here. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, Akhi, uh, Jazakur for joining me, first of all. We, the last time we spoke, you was uh, here uh, just before the lockdown. Alhamdulillah, we were discussing uh, resale and uh, thinking about putting together some kind of uh, stool at the live event that we wanted to do. And then, alhamdulillah, because of obviously everything that's happened, the live event got cancelled as well. Uh, but it's, it's it's nice, alhamdulillah, that we've been able to uh, kind of reconnect. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I appreciate you kind of uh, jumping on with me, man. Um, no problem. It's a pleasure. I, the, the, the thing I wanted to kind of uh, start off with is uh, obviously... Since the um, murder of George Floyd, there's been a lot of videos and stuff going uh, uh, online as that, that have been shared. And one that you shared, I think the, the the message after you shared it was really powerful. So I, I wanted to see if you touch on it. And it was it was a video of a man, an old man, saying um, he was he was in a, he was he, they were doing a news report on him. <clears throat> You know which one I'm talking about, and he said I was in my yeah. house. He had he had blood coming out of his eye, and he goes, I was just. They said, What happened to you? He said, I was just in my house, and I was saying that all lives matter, and uh, these black people came up to me and started beating me up, and I was just in my house saying it from my window, and mm -hmm. the reporter was like, Oh, you were just in your house, blah, blah. and then the next video that you showed was that whole thing was basically a lie. It showed the video of him actually um, outside. And uh, I'm not sure what he was saying, but he was making a very loud fuss outside and he wasn't in his house at all. And he, he, was, he was lying. He was completely lying. And it was what yeah. you said after that really, um, I think, resonated with me. And what you said after was, it's because of people like this who nine times out of ten, don't, you don't get to see the recording of what actually happened. And so it's because of people mm -hmm. like this that um, there's a lot of black brothers that are in um, prison, black men and black women who are in prison because of people like that who make lies. Um, just touch mm -hmm. on what you were kind of mentioning there, because I thought it was really powerful. Yeah, because obviously what had happened, like you said, the guy claimed to be in his house, um, and he claimed that people were shouting slogans of Black Lives Matter. So he replied with All Lives Matter, and because of that, he had got punched in his face. But then a video showed that he was in the middle of traffic shooting bone, a bone arrow into a crowd of people. And the crowd of people that he was shooting these arrows to were not only black, but a mixed group of people. So you had white Asians, you know, Caucasians, everybody was in that group. And the video itself actually shows him shooting bow and arrows into the crowd. And then it shows a group of 
you know, Caucasian white people attacking him for that. Because as you see the marches that are going on worldwide in Berlin, in Spain, in France, in Japan, you know, everyone's coming out. It's not a, a, a black, uh, you know, black versus white thing. This is a, 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 a human race versus racism. These are like human beings have come together as a group of people and they're having a stance against racism. But why that video was so, you know, close to home to me was a lot of the times we watch documentaries of African-Americans and just African or black people from different parts of the world who are incarcerated and they swear down, you know, that they didn't commit the crime that they've been put in prison for. And we've seen lots of cases of injustice in the earlier days before forensics, before cameras, of, you know, black people who were, you know, put to the electric chair only to years find out later with evidence of forensics that they didn't actually commit that crime. And this was the a clear visual of how something like this unfolds. Because here you have, you know, a white Caucasian man telling the news report that he had been punched in the face by two black people for screaming out All Lives Matter. And then in the second video, you see that he was actually you know, instigating and violence in a crowd of people. And then he was attacked by white people. But he still came on national TV with his big Chester held up high and was able to yeah, he lie. he was very confident in what he was saying. Yeah, very confident and was able to lie and look the camera dead in the eye and say he was punched in the face by two African-Americans. So if you look at someone like this and you multiply it with you know, the amount of people that live in the United States and how many, you know, uh, are these people have been in court systems, have been on the jury, have been, you know, uh, someone who's come to give evidence and have just stood on the stand and lied. And because of that, and the consequence of that has made that some young black men within the African community and women have had to serve long periods of sentences or even life sentences. And some of them have had to lose their life because of things like that. It's just, it's, we know it happens, but it's a whole different story when you actually see it. So I feel like with the death of of um, of the brother that got, that passed away in America, Floyd, is that it's it's not nothing new, you know. Uh, it's something that's been happening for a long time, but the video has changed a lot. And I think also if it wasn't in a period of lockdown and coronavirus. We seem to have um, lost our day-to-day -day lives, our busy lives, our busy scheduled lives. If we were just, you know, going to work and dealing with the day-to-day -day stresses that we had before COVID, I don't think it might have got the same amount of attention. And I feel like the fact that everyone's off school, off college, off uni, you know, people are just at home and they were able to see this and take it in. And the fact that COVID-19 has also brought people together because yeah. with COVID-19 and that people have been, you know, food parcels, you know, religious groups have been sharing things and distributing food and helping the communities. COVID-19 has brought the community and the world together because it's something that we're all facing as a whole. And COVID-19 doesn't discriminate. COVID-19 has taken lives of every type of race. It hasn't just taken the black lives. It hasn't just taken Asian or Arab or, you know, or white or whatever. Every type of person, you know, every type of race has passed away and died and has been a victim of COVID-19. So I feel like that has brought a unity worldwide that has put us in a position to be ready for something like this. And I think pre-COVID-19, this might not have happened, the same reaction. But I feel like that unity that has been brought on by COVID-19 and the fact that everyone's at home and has been able to watch this, I think it's brought around a different reaction. And I think, you know, it's, it's important that we take this time to kind of evaluate how we want to move forward as a generation, you know. And I think it's just important for us to kind of understand what we're seeing here, what we're a part of, because COVID-19 was one thing on its own. But COVID-19 is a virus that we have, you know, we can get a cure for. Whether it's like the flu, whether it's things like Ebola, you know, scientists go in the lab, 
they come together, they work their hardest and they get, you know, a cure for vi- or, or some type of, you know, some type of antibody to kind of deal with things like this. But with systematic racism, it's something that we haven't been able to get rid of for over 400 years. You know what I mean? And if we look at the civil rights movement, which is over 60 years ago, you would have thought within that period of time that, you know, as a group of people, we would have come a lot further. Because if you look at the police officer who actually kneeled on uh, on the guy, on Floyd, for that for that how long, it's not just that, you know, he kneeled on him and, and he killed him on camera. It's the confidence and the, you know, that he portrayed. He just, he'd done it like, I'm on camera, I don't care. What can anyone, what can anyone do to me? I'm not gonna get off him. Yeah, I don't care what he says. Yes, you're recording me and what? That he was able to, you know, have that confidence to, you know, to do that. And why, why does he, you know, where does a person get that confidence if he doesn't believe that there's a system that backs him and that allows him to, you know, to be like that. Right. <clears throat> I, 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 um, it takes me back to, to the days when I was studying uh, criminology at university. I remember one particular moment that was like a light switch for me. And um, what happened is I will never I won't forget this moment, man. And I've, I, I've spoken about it in the past. And one of the modules in criminology um, was policing. Right. Um, and, and yes, you talk about kind of policing in general, like how societies police themselves, how individuals police themselves. But the police force was one of the kind of uh, aspects that we studied as well. And I remember this lecture clearly. I can remember where I'm, where I'm sat, what I was looking at. And in this specific lecture, for some reason, what they did is they basically just played us um, secret footage of police training in this, in this module, right? And um, it was footage from a few years back and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, the, the, the reason they were showing it to us is to show the uh, discrimination that happens even within these systems, within uh, the kind of the police force. And... Um, we were watching this footage and in the changing room, so it, uh, at this point they just had the audio and in the changing room, the, the, these trainee policemen uh, were just just racist remarks, racist remarks, racist remarks. And I'm not saying that all policemen are like that, but what I am saying is cool. what we heard in the lecture. And I just remember thinking to myself, because a lot of people who study criminology, they'll go in to work for the police whether they work to be a constable or they work a bit higher up to to to, to help with investigations or just to um like study their mind with a criminal they work in some way in a police force and i remember that being the thing that flicked the switch for me and i thought I, I, how can you work in an environment in which it's got to the level where they now teach at universities that this is what you have to prepare for or, or this is what's happening inside the police force with secret footage and um it goes on to what you were just mentioning which was systematic racism and Subhanallah, bro. The live that you did, I think it was it yesterday, the soul sessions. Yeah. You've done one soul sessions, or have you done two now? I've done I think I've done about two now, two or three. So the one that you did was uh, that I'm talking about here is the one where the brother was speaking about systematic racism. Okay, Raymond Douglas, yeah. And that was such a powerful live. It should have been televised. It was such yeah. a powerful live because he just kind of broke down. Um, he broke down systematic racism and then he, he gave the statistics that you can't argue against. Yeah, of course. And that's why I feel like it's very important when we deal with racism from whether it from from any ethnic minority group, whether it's, you know, like I said, black, Asian, um, whether I should say Pan-African, Asian or Arab is that um, whenever we deal with racism, I think it's very important that we deal with a systematic um, systematic approach because you know you know like lived experience racism can differ you could have grown up around white people your whole life black people your whole life and have never experienced racism and that could be something that when you go through that one minute you could so when you go through that as someone yourself you've never experienced it so i know i know a lot of people who come online and be like you know, my best friend's black or my best friend's white, my best friend's Asian. I've never had that. I went to an Asian school. I went to a white school, blah, blah, blah. And personally, they haven't experienced no racism. So sometimes they can play down um, the actual facts of what racism is. Or you might find a person who is black and says, well, the most racism I've ever faced was from Asians. Or you find an Asian person who says, well, the most racism I faced was 
growing up in South London, being the only Asian in a black school. I, I, I faced racism all day and it wasn't from whites, it was from blacks. So again, that's a lived experience and which is, and your truth is your truth. You went through that, yes. But that, to, to, to some extent, that's levels of discrimination where people discriminate you, will discriminate you know, against you for many reasons. Your race, your height, you have, like, if you're wealthy, you're poor, you know, like, example, as a group of people, naturally speaking, from the hood in brackets, a lot of the time we'll discriminate against rich people. We'll say, what do rich people know about living like this? What do rich people know about life? What do, and there is a lot of rich people who maybe do know about that because they came from poverty and made money. They weren't born with wealth. But we're going to discriminate on, on the on the basis of how we see rich people. So people get discriminated on many different levels. But when we talk about systematic racism, which affects you from the minute that you are born, that there are systems in a place that you live from the minute that you're born, your wealth, your health care is affected, your welfare is affected. How likely is that from, you know, that a black kid that is 10 years old, within a five-year space of him being 10 to 15, so much changes for him in society, whether he's in Oxford or whether he's in London. It's, it's irrelevant because the statistics that talk about how many times he's more likely to be stopped than his counterparts, how, you know, how many more times he's likely to be arrested than his counterparts, you know, how many more times he's likely to you know, maybe face discrimination or racism with trying to find a job than his counterparts. These, this is irrelevant to whether you were called, you know, a black so-and-so so or an Asian so-and-so. Whether you never experienced that in your life, there are statistical facts that will tell you that there are going to be difficulties and challenges within your life, whether you face open racism or, you know, or not. So yeah. a lot of the time when we talk... Go on. Sorry, but uh, just on that point, one of the one of the really powerful stats uh, that was given on that live was the was the fact that um, for every and and I think that when you was listening to this as well, it, 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 I remember you pausing that for every one hundred um, offenders that are white that um, are uh, put into um, high high security prisons, uh, four hundred and ninety four. Uh, black yeah. people who uh, yeah, commit the same offence are put into high security same prison. Friends. The same offence. Yes, the same offence. And that's these these are the statistics that we're talking about. So we're saying you could be a black person, you could be you could be you know Michael from Oxford, who's grown up in a you know in a good environment, never faced racism, never had a problem before with the police or anything like that. But for some reason, you commit an offence. Or, you know, something happens in your life where you can commit an offence like you just mentioned, which is similar to any other white person within Oxford, but you have more than three times likely the chance of ending up in a high, you know, high risk prison compared to your counterpart. And you and you don't know that life. You know, example, your offence might be that you went out on a Friday night, got drunk, got into a fight, punched someone and got arrested for GBH and then was sent to prison for GBH. And that same offence, GBH, that your white counterpart might also be arrested for and sent to prison for, you are more than four times, like, or, or whatever the numbers are, likely to end up in a high-risk prison than he is. And you're not even about that life. He might be more about that life than you. But these are the statistics that are institutional that affect you as a whole. So I feel like we're living in a time now where I get it. A lot of people want to talk about, you know, lived experiences. But I feel lived experiences cheat us out of the real systematic oppression that we're facing as ethnic minorities here in the UK. And it might be that the black community is in the spotlight now and we find that every oppression has its time. You know, it's not it's not this or that. Every oppression has its time in the spotlight and we have to fight against it. But if you look at it as a whole as ethnic minority groups and you look at um, the stuff that's going on, you come to see that... Um, the systematic racism affects us and affects our children. You being Asian, you know, and ha having maybe an Asian family, um, children, your child, there are statistics, you know, already against your children, whether they be in primary school or secondary school, that will affect them in, throughout their life. Whether you give them the best education or not, there are already statistics out here, institutional statistics, that will say, 
you know, an Asian person is more likely to this, an Asian person is more likely to that. And that's without anyone even yet to call them a racist name. And I feel like these are things that... um, Sorry, but I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, so I feel like these are the things that we have to look at as a whole, as a community, because these things affect all of us. They affect my children, your children. So whether the fact that I grew up in Brixton, South London, and I was called racist names or not, yeah, it's problematic, but I might have been called these names and you might never have been called those names. But there's one thing that's definitely going to affect all of us is the statistics that break down, you know, the challenges that we're going to face as a community and as a whole. And I feel like it's very important. And yes, we know, you know, one of the go-to points is that to talk about racism with Islam. And one of the biggest problems we find as a Muslim community is that the first thing that people throw out there is that there's no racism in Islam. But my thinking to that is that there's no listening to music in Islam, but we do it. There's no drinking alcohol in Islam, but Muslims do it. There's no clubbing in Islam, but Muslims do it. There's no, you know, boyfriends and girlfriends in Islam, but Muslims do it. So then why point out the fact that there's no racism in Islam as if that is a barrier to us facing racism? Muslims will be racist. That's just part and parcel of one of the things that are not allowed in Islam, but sadly, as a group of people, as Muslims, you know, with our own shortfalls, we're going to find racism. So, so that isn't a, a default setting to when you hear someone from the Asian community or the black community talk about racism. Our first thing shouldn't be there's no racism in Islam, there's no colour in Islam, because half of the people that say that, you know, go clubbing, go raving, do all of those things, and that's not from Islam. So if we can do all of those things, why can't we be racist at the same time? You know what I'm trying to say? So I just feel like it's very important for us to understand people's differences and different and, and, and other people's pains. And like a lot of the time me and Abu Bakr talk about, there's many things because of doing, you know, roadside to Islam and coming up from that background, we dealt with youth from different backgrounds, Arab, you know, Asian, um, Caucasian, you name it, we dealt with those young people. And every young person had a problem which was specific to their background and where they came from and their culture. And some of the things we just couldn't talk about because we didn't understand it and we wouldn't do it justice. It's not befitting for me to come and talk about an issue, you know, pertaining to do with a a white reaver accepting Islam, coming from a racist family who then, you know, kind of, you know, kick him out of his house, want nothing to do with him because the background of his family might be in brackets racist and he has to go through that 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 type of you know trial and then I come online and I talk about oh white people this white I don't know that life because I haven't experienced that the only person who can kind of give him an insight to that is maybe someone who is older who is from the same community who's experienced that and has experience in ways how to deal with it but it isn't right for me to come and say well um, black people f- face difficulties as well. You might have been kicked out by your family, but I'm not allowed to go to the mosque. Or, you know, it's like, it's either, it, we're always trying to compare trials. Someone talks about their reality and their trial, we're quick to bring it down by saying, well, you know, I have issues as well. Rather than just support, understand, listen, more time, all the things, more more time, the most important things that me and Abu Bakr used to do with Real Side to Islam is we used to just be a, a point to listen. Sometimes people just want to be heard. They want to be able to tell someone their difficulties, their trials, their tribulations without being judged, just being heard and be, and just being and just being another person on the other line to say, SubhanAllah, may Allah make it easy for you, brother. SubhanAllah, may Allah make it easy for your sister. That's a difficult trial, no doubt. That's definitely difficult. Rather than be like, oh, don't worry, sister, when I was your age, this and this happened to me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like... It's belittling it. You know, people, you know, if someone doesn't get raped and then they tell you about their ordeal and you're like, ah, don't worry about that. People have been raped for hundreds of years. You don't belittle it by bringing up something else that's worse. You have to hear them out, understand them, you know, and try to empathize and sympathize with the situation and try to, to get an understanding for our brothers and sisters. Because at the end of the day, as a group of people, especially as Muslims, you know, we are brothers and sisters and we need to have more empathy and more sympathy because as a group, and another thing that I would say, as a group of people, like you mentioned, the police service 
and listening to those tapes and hearing racism, the reality is is that every group within society it, it, it just mirrors the overall the overall society. If the society that we live in is racist, you're going to get racist doctors, racist you know people in the fire in the, in the fire brigade, in the police system, in the court system, because they're just going to mirror society. You're going to get racist footballers, people in sport. You're going to get racist imams racist priests because they mirror society you know what i mean and until we change the societal issue of institutional racism and being having real respect for each other which i think the new generation is prepared for because we've never had more you know inter intermixing or you know communication i feel like with smartphones our communication levels gone you know from zero to a hundred how we're able to communicate with people from all different walks of lives. And I feel like this communication is going to give us, you know, a foot, a foot, uh, uh, it's going to give us a footing to have a better understanding of people's problems. And yes, people are still going to be racist and yes, they're going to still be pockets, but it won't be on a societal level or on an institutional level where people let it slide. And I think we're seeing that with these marches that people do want to affect policy because none of these things are going to change unless the policies change that allow these things to continue. Yeah, I think there's so many powerful points about what you just said. And just to pick up on a few of them, um, first of all, uh, what you so rightly said, basically, that the idea that uh, Islam is perfect, but Muslims are not. And um, uh, something that comes to mind uh, that kind of relates to the situation now, uh, which shows the power of social media, is that if you look at Islam and the the the, the, the perfect nature of it, and we see that when there are problems, there's different. Um, uh, we have different approaches in the sense that we know an ayah from the Quran where uh, we're told that if you um, Allah won't change the condition of a people until they change what is within themselves. So essentially, in in making individual change, each person making individual change. But also, how often in Islam um, are we reminded about a righteous leader, about good leadership, about the um, about the responsibility of a leader? They're two completely separate things. People yeah, fixing themselves, and then people, and then the leaders being of a certain, having a certain responsibility. And I think the power of social media right now has shown that people are. Um, people are encouraging individuals to make changes within themselves, but they're at the same time making petitions, at the same time protesting, and at the same time trying to appeal to the people in power. And that is just like how we can we can see the two the two there the 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 until you change the condition of yourself, we're not going to be able to change the condition mm -hmm. of society. But also righteous leaders, and Alhamdulillah, but I think through social media, we're getting that kind of multifaceted approach. I don't even know if multifaceted is a word or, or the correct word, but yeah, hundred percent, I believe so. Like you said, I feel like you know leadership is very important from the aspects of you know Islam and any civil rights movement, any change that has taken place within society, whether it's any any change that has taken place by strong leaders or my strong movements have had strong leaders. And I feel like without having a strong leader in terms of any community, even though we know in Islam that, you know, it's not befitting for a Muslim community not to have leadership for more than three days and a minute, you know, because after that, it's just calamity. So, and we've gone years without strong leadership within the Muslim world. But as a group of people, or if you want to talk about black people, that's a problem. Then we also, there's collective punishment in Islam because a lot of the time people also forget that Islam has collective punishment. How many times have we read in Quran or in the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala we've held back, you know, blessings and bounties from a group of people just because of one individual? When Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala was speaking to Musa Alayhi Salam, and Allah and Musa and Allah and Musa Alayhi Salam was asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala directly to send down rain, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala told Musa Alayhi Salam, amongst you, there's a, amongst your group of people, there's a sinner, just one sinner amongst you. And Musa alayhi salam told the people that Allah said that he won't bring down, you know, the, the bounty for us because amongst us is, is a sinner until he repents and turns back to Allah. And from nowhere, you know, the, 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 the bounties came down. And then Musa said to Allah, well, nobody repented. Like, who is he? Like, what happened? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, yeah, he may told, but he repented. But if I didn't tell him, tell you about him when he was a sinner, why would I tell you about him after he's repented? But for me, that shows you that one person, our actions as sinful Muslims can affect the whole Jamaat. People are quick to say, don't judge me. 
only Allah can judge me. No, brother, your sin can stop the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala falling down on everybody. And this is why we have this, this, you know, this principle of saving yourselves and your family, you know, rectifying, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, won't change the, the, the you know, the, 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 the state of a person until they change themselves. And it's important that we individually change our states because we can't afford to have individuals who are openly sinning and who are openly, you know, committing problems within our community because it has a direct effect on all of us. We're not talking about private sins. We're talking about those who commit sins in the open. It has a direct effect on the Ummah. So you might see, uh, you know, just off topic. Have you lost um, me? Yeah, I've lost you for a sec. That's why I switched so, to the car. I think what's happened is my... Go ahead. So we might have, um, like, off topic, we might see the issues that take place in the Muslim world, whether it's Yemen, Syria, Palestine. We see the calamities that are taking place and the oppression in the world. And as Muslims, we're, you know, we're confused. Why, why, why? But yet, we're the same group of people who are openly disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are the same group of people who are openly showing our, our you know, our, our just disrespect and, you know, our, our outright, you know, disapproval of being able to, to hide our sins in public and just being disobedient and, you know, rebellious towards the rules and regulations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I feel like it's important for Muslims, man, to understand that your sins, your open sins, we're all sinners. That's not a problem. But your open sins can have an effect on your family members, your community and your umrah at, at large. And I feel like it's, it's high time that a lot of us look at ourselves and sometimes think to themselves, like example, some of the Sahaba, the Salaf, they used to come back to their homes and their families or their children might not listen to them. Their children might be disobedient. You know, they might have family problems with their wives. Even their riding beast, their animal will be playing up and they would look to themselves and say, Panallah, mate, it's because of my sins, you know, my children are not listening to me. It's because of my sins, I'm having problems with my wife. It's because of my sins, my riding beast, my, my horse or my camel is, is not as healthy or is not as agile as it used to be. They would look at their sins as a cause for the problems in their lives, you know, affecting others. Whereas today, we're blasé about it. So I feel like, you know, as a community, we need to understand that my sins affect you, your sins affect me. So it's very important that we hide it in the public. You know, we don't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in public. And what we do in private, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and to keep us sincere I mean, and to work towards, you know, rectifying our community and, you know, the places we live at large. And this is why, again, I say that the importance of doing charity and aiding people on the doorsteps that you live on, you know, in the communities that you live on. Because there's not, like, one thing I'd say, there's one, it, it, there's a reason why a lot of people love the British state. There's a reason why the uh, Americans are envious of the NHS system. Because it's an NHS system which is inclusive. Whether you have work or you don't have work. Whether you're rich or you're poor, it's a system that has a tax system where everyone pays in who works for those who don't work and everybody is allowed free healthcare. People all over the world are jealous of that system who don't have that system. There's a reason people are happy that they have a benefit system here that if they find themselves in a situation where they don't have work, they know that aid will come to them. And there's a reason why a lot of people don't want to go back to places that they come from because of these very facts. A lot you'd hear it in, our, in, in, in ethnic minor, minority communities about not wanting to be back home because there's no NHS or healthcare or things like this. So it shows you that charity at home and in the place that you live in is very important to winning over the hearts and minds. And I feel like as a community, if we want to do that, we need to go into the non-Muslim Asian community, the non-Muslim black community, the non-Muslim white community, the non-Muslim Arab community, and be able to help them and aid them on their day-to-day -day struggles as Muslims, as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. So, we need to be able to help people for that to grow the hearts and minds. So whenever we're attacked as a community, whenever we're spoken bad about as a community, these are the very same individuals who are going to say, hold on, you know, I've known Muslims my whole life. 
You know, they're, they're, they're the ones that supported me when I didn't have a job. They're the ones that helped me when my child was high on drugs and, and they helped him get through rehab. They're the ones that supported me when I had an, a, a drinking problem, alcohol problem. They got me drink free. They're the ones that supported me through bereavement when I lost a family member through their services. They're the ones that supported me when, you know, my car broke down and, you know, they had a service for fixing cars and they'd done it for free or whatever service we might be providing. When you have that connection with people, you can't then turn around and be like, you know, they're all this, they're all that. But the fact that the average non-Muslim, black, Asian, whoever it may be, white, doesn't have that connection, doesn't have that, you know, interaction with a Muslim, you know, at a wide scale, it makes it very difficult for them to come to our aid when watching and hearing the propaganda that gets spread out about us. And I think it's important that we learn from these things as a group of people and start to really do a lot of work in the places that we live in. I think um, that the, the, uh, you're, you're, uh, I completely resonate with you when you're saying that we need to be able to um, individually improve ourselves, whether that means... Um, bettering ourselves individually whether that means giving more charity and whether that means being better to the people around us and like you said earlier there's no doubt that there's also a, a very big systemat systematic problem that has to be fixed um in which um uh, it, which is very in uh unjust is that the word or unjust to the black community yeah. and um yeah. And we spoke about the kind of injustice to the black community in the prison and the criminal justice system, but that's not at all where it uh, necessarily starts or stops. And um, even just doing some reading beforehand and seeing um, once that like um, the, with regards to jobs, right? And um, and the fact that um, a, 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 if a black person um, graduates and a white person graduates, um, the white person is 50%. Uh, more likely uh, to not be turned away from a job after graduation because yeah. of um, because of their name because of their name and uh, and and again and I know I keep referring back to it but the live that you did yesterday which I think was was so informative um, in which the brother was mentioning the school system and he was saying that yeah. um, the catchment areas uh, for young black boys and girls um, statistically mm. gets shortened down to four and out of those four two of them have been um kind of uh reported by Ofsted as as yep. kind of yep. not uh, not great and then because of that the teachers that they're bringing in are perhaps getting lesser degrees and he, yep. he was talking about this entire system and then he went on to speak about the um the head teachers and about 15 uh 15 i think he said uh black yep. head teachers yep. in the whole of the uk and and when you see oh. all of these things you realize that yes we need to improve ourselves as people but but more than anything to, to, to figure out how we can I suppose impact um, the the systems, but uh, and, and and you know I'm, I can't say that I have the answer to that at all, I, I, and I have to say that I um, am aware that I have to do so much more education, so much more reading about um, the societal issues that we have around us, uh, and I think this is this is highlighted that for, for for a lot of us. Yeah, I think it's important, man, hundred percent, and I just feel like. Um, you know, I think sometimes a lot of times when people don't know something, um, they're quick to dismiss it out of embarrassment. You know, it's like being it's like being asked a simple maths question, you know, like what's two plus two? And then not knowing the answer and telling someone like, don't be silly. Why are you asking me something silly like that? Everyone knows that. In reality, you don't. And I feel like we've come to a point in society now where there's so much information, but yet as a community, whether it's black, Asian or Arab, like I, like, like I say, we don't know enough about our history and, our, and colonialism and the impact that, you know, the colonial um, powers that be had against, you know, the countries that we come from. A lot of the time we don't understand the systematic, you know, imprint that, that was put on the places that, you know, our parents came from and why they are how they are. So a lot of the time we just brush things off because we don't understand it. I feel like it's come to a point now where we have to inform ourselves and have to gain more knowledge on, you know, everything around us in terms of where we come from, what the imperial powers that be, the effects that it had on our countries. A lot of the time we forget that a lot of the Muslim countries that um, we look up to in terms of spiritual guidance and leadership were also colonized, you know, and, you know, were also under the British rule. And a lot of the times we forget that. And we have to understand wherever the British went, they set up systems of caste, of power, 
and 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 it put something in the hearts and minds of those people that they went over and, and you know and and colonized. And so sometimes we forget and we just you know don't put you know we don't add the two together to to get the results that under to to let us understand this is why a group of people think the way they think. This is why they're so far off their true history because after this period and the dip, uh, and 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 the things that they were taught through colonialism it affected them like this there's so many you know learned behaviors that communities have which are not naturally from their communities but are through the systematic pressures that they went through through colonialism and things like that but i feel like right now we're in a time of information and people have to just be more informed and not to be shy to say i don't know you know there's a lot of black um you know black women and uh, and men who don't know much about their history and sometimes it feels embarrassing not to know but it's about time to say you know what i don't know let me learn you know let me learn let me learn about black history let me learn about asian history let me learn about the effects you know that the british you know imperial powers that at be had against us let me let me understand how it affects us today or it affects some of the people in our communities and their thinking and how we can kind of because only once you know would you be able to start working against it and and being able to, to create a new system to better your and i think this is important right now and this is something i was telling abubak i think rather than it being a time for us to to um complain it's a time because we've been complaining we've been saying a lot of things for many a times many a year and not much has changed but in that period of time we haven't informed ourselves enough with information and understanding to to better ourselves as a community listen musa um i really appreciate your time i um i know that i said that i would only take up 30 minutes of your time so forgive me we've gone a bit over Problem. Um, but I, no, I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate your insight and I appreciate your posts that you've been putting out recently. I've been keeping an eye on them. Uh, please continue to do the lives if you if if you if you feel to, um, because they're so so powerful. Um, and Jazakallah uh, khair again. Thank you for 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 jumping on our platform and 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 enabling but us yeah, to no kind problem. of do something to 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 raise some kind of uh, awareness or promote education um, in in this field. And and you know. I think we need to be doing more, but um, I appreciate that you that you have joined us on on the platform to be able to to get started with something. No doubt, man. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. I want to get you in touch with Raymond, man. I want you to pick his Please. pick pick his brain. Um, he's a, he's a very you know uh, intellectual and and very grounded individual in terms of this field. He's someone that's worked in the prison system for a very long time. Had keys to women and men's prisons. He's someone that's been in education for a very long time and kind of understands it on a nuance, you know, nuance level, and is very well versed in, in in making things easy for us to understand as a group of people, man. So I'm definitely going to put you in contact with him. I would love that. Thank you so much, and I believe you because every time you mention that you're going to uh, put someone in touch with us <coughs> to jump on the podcast, you always follow through with it. And Alhamdulillah, we've had some great guests on uh, because of your uh, suggestion yeah. or, or you being able to kind of connect the dots. So I appreciate that, man. No problem, man. We speak soon, man. Love for having you. Take it easy, bro. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.